All right, here it is, episode number 721 of Let There Be Talk, and it is the day before Halloween. Spooky time! Spooky time! How are you guys? How was your weekend? Were you out there fucking running around with your Taylor Swift costumes? Did you dress up like a Swifty? <laughs> Halloween, I didn't see very many costumes over the weekend at shows. I was at the comedy store on Saturday night. That's the big Halloween night, I guess, because uh, Halloween's on a Tuesday. Always a drag when something cools on a weeknight. Back in the day when I used to uh, work a day job, you'd be like, oh, fuck, Halloween's on a Tuesday. So many Halloween stories, man. So many Halloween stories. Such a wild thing to think about. Trick or treating. I can't even imagine being a 57-year-old adult right now and thinking about anybody that would let their kid trick or treat in this insane fucking world. Man, back in the day, back in the day, trick or treating in the 70s, you know? With kidnappers out there, Patty Hearst, the SLA was in full effect. He had the Hillside Strangler, Dahmer. Uh, all, all the serial killers were booming. And yet, we were out there trick-or-treating, trusting strangers, trusting full strangers, uh, giving us candy. Oh my God, it's so fucking twisted to think about right now when I would be trick-or-treating back in the day. Hillside Strangler, all those serial killers in full effect. You know, the the old stories of you know, the kid, you know, the, there was razor blades in his candy. He swallowed it and it cut his throat up and he died. There was LSD in the candy. Just, it, it, you know, there was rat poison in the candy. And yet you're out there you're like, I'm getting fucking candy. You know, I got a paper route. You spend your hard-earned money on candy. And once a year, you can get free candy. Or if you go visit your grandma, she always had fudge. My grandma made fudge. Pure proof that you're a grandma if you make fudge. That's how we know you're officially a grandma. I got fudge. So wild. Remember the people you ever have this person? They fucking just leave money, money out there. Or the people that trusted you, they would say, take one. Just take one. They didn't want to answer the door. So you'd fucking just pour the whole bucket in your pillowcase. Always a pillowcase. Fuck these trick or treat orange little buckets. Or these paper bags. It was a, a a full on pillowcase because back then older kids would fucking come around and try to steal your bag on their BMX bikes, and you know you'd be walking and they just come riding down the street full smash and grab. Back in the seventies, I grew up with the original smash and grabbers. You trick or treat all night, and then they fucking swoop you, and you know. I have so many trick or treats uh, memories. It's it is wild costumes, everything like that. It, remember the neighbor that would didn't want to fucking participate, so they just turned the lights off. Remember those guys? And then of course egging houses during trick or treat. There's so many fucking crazy memories of trick or treating in the seventies. I remember one year. My mom was like, okay, you guys be back around nine. And me and my buddy, we trick-or-treated till like 1030. <laughs> Just knocking on doors. People are like going to bed. They're like, yeah, we're like trick-or-treat. <laughs> we're in fucking sixth grade, 1030 at night. Oh my God. I just can't imagine trick-or-treating now. They got those, you know, Every town has the rich neighborhood where the people take their kids. My mom would do that once in a while. She'd take us to like a rich neighborhood. And uh, how about the fucker that would give you fruit? Rich neighborhood, you'd go there. They go, here's an apple. You go, oh, fuck you. You'd throw it at the house. 
but every uh, city has that rich neighborhood and you bring your kids over there to trick or treat where they don't get any rat poison. It is a wild concept, trick or treating, man. Uh, I don't, I don't know if they really do it very much now. I think it's done in like controlled environments. Like you go to a mall and each store has uh candy out there and stuff trick or treat man you know what I, I and then later on as you get fucking older you start going to halloween parties getting drunk picking the wrong costume i remember one year i was uh i played hockey so i went as a hockey player the worst ever i had all my hockey equipment on and every fucking 10 minutes i had to piss so I had to take the whole fucking hockey pants down and Oh, nightmare. Nightmare. And then uh, you always got that one buddy who who dresses like a woman every year. You're like, hey, dude, that's just you. Just go ahead and dress like a woman all the time. You're uh, Every Halloween, you have to wait to, to act like you're, y'all just be a woman. It's like, just do it now. We're all cool. We know. <laughs> Holy shit, man. Anyway, happy uh, Halloween. Tomorrow night is Halloween and uh, so many great things circle around Halloween. I will tell you this. One of the greatest memories I have, and I've told this story before, but I had to look it up tonight because something happened great last night to me that uh, I feel uh, another another wild uh, encounter has happened because of stand-up comedy. Stand-up comedy is the gift that just keeps giving to me over all these years, things that have happened from doing stand-up comedy, like uh, getting in Guitar Player Magazine when I couldn't get in there, uh, playing music. I got in as a comedian doing that show uh, called Baked, that where I would, uh, you, you do a set and then sing with the band. It was called Baked, and it was done at the Baked Potato. And uh, it was a fantastic show. Got in guitar player. You know, just crazy things. Playing the uh, venues I never got to play as a musician, mostly because of the great Bill Burr having me at Red Rocks and stuff, which, by the way, November 10th, Madison Square Garden. Tour dates are up right now on deandelray.com. While I got your attention, Norfolk, Virginia, Atlanta, Georgia, Hollywood, Florida, and New York City. That's all uh, next week. And then December 20th, I will be at the Irvine Improv headlining. And then uh, going back to the Comedy Fort in Fort Collins in 2024. Those are some of the dates. Vegas also coming up uh, a week in Vegas in January. So tour dates. Anyway. The reason I bring up, uh, like I was saying, some uh, amazing things that happened. And one of them was uh, last night, I was asked to do Linda Blair's charity. She has a dog rescue charity, and they asked me to perform at it. And to meet Linda Blair is so fucking wild to me. And so, I mean... There I was talking to her and I just had fucking full flashbacks and I had to look it up. This is what I was saying. So I've always told the story to people that me and my buddy, Mark Gardeman, we paid for, I believe it was like uh, some shitty movie that, you know, was like rated PG and it was a two theater. One of those uh, dual cinemas in the seventies, they started doing the dual cinema. Now it's all megaplexes, but back then it was just giant theaters. And then they started making these dual cinemas. So I had to look it up because uh, Linda told me last night that The Exorcist is 50 years old this year. And I was like, fuck, I couldn't have seen that when I was seven. There's just no fucking way. But then it hit me, I remember, they did a full re-release, 70 millimeter in 1979. And that is when I saw The Exorcist. And we paid to see some shitty movie, like, I don't know, uh, Herbie the Love Bug, some fucking film. 
you know, Freaky Friday, some shit that was playing in the one theater. We paid and then we snuck in, me and Mark Gardeman, and sat in there and watched The Exorcist. And I don't know if that was a good thing. 79, how old was I? So I was born in 66. So, you know, it's right around sixth grade. And uh, is that right? Sixth grade, 66, 76, 10, 12 years old. Mm, maybe, yeah, six, sixth grade summer or something. I don't know. It wasn't summer. It was Halloween. I don't know. I'm fucking old. And I did lots of drugs, my friend. Okay. But we paid. We got in there. We start watching The Exorcist. Okay. And I'm going to tell you this right now. The greatest, scariest fucking movie of all time. Still to this day. Ask anybody. Kirk Hammett, who is a deep, deep, scary movie master this guy knows all kinds of scary movies that come out every year him and my buddy over there nick at maidworn whenever kirk and uh, nick are around they're like hey did you see uh zombie dust or whatever zombie dust that's a, a movie I, a, a idea i came up with but whatever they're talking scary movies they go deep on it all the time but if you ask anybody kirk hammett anybody into scary films the greatest of all time is The Exorcist. And I've said it before, but I believe the reason it's so fucking scary is, you know, you have the, the classic scary monster movies and you have the uh, Freddy Kruegers and that kind of stuff. But with The Exorcist and later on The Omen, when you're a kid and you grow up around religious like my grandmother was religious and you go to church once in a while and you know when you're young they're like don't swear don't take drugs don't don't do any of this shit or that you know they won't let you into heaven the devil's here and they, you know it's scary with all that dumb shit but when you're young to me the exorcist seemed like it could happen you know there's always uh playground talk of like yeah i heard about this guy he was possessed by the devil in upstate new york and you know just fucking stories so that's why to me the exorcist is the scariest also it's done so fucking well and the acting is so incredible and the sound and the cinematography and the set Everything about it is just beyond scary, okay? Still to this day. So we sneak in, we see this. And we're neither of us are really telling each other that we're scared because we're at that age where we're trying to be, you know, little badasses, you know? Like, yeah, fucking, fucking nothing scares me, man. I'll stay up all night. <laughs> but... Uh, Mark lived one way from the theater and I lived the other way. And I used to take this uh, shortcut through the creek that I could just hop over a couple fences and get to my house way faster. So as soon as we walk out of there, it's dark now. We went like at four in the afternoon. We go out, it's dark. And I'm like, fuck, I got to walk home. And I'm walking home and I'm fucking legitimately stunned by this movie legitimately and as i deep uh, did a deep dive today and I've, I've known a lot of this stuff on the exorcist over the years i've been kind of obsessed with it that the shining these type of movies that are just really mind-boggling uh you know jaws i'm not talking all scary godfather apocalypse now i'm talking about films that really fuck you up uh mentally as far as being such a high state of art such a another level like you see a, a bunch of movies and then all of a sudden you see something that is a game changer and it just sticks with you for a long long time most of uh, us a lifetime especially jaws which i'm getting ready uh next week when i'm in new york me and my buddy steve are going to see 
uh, the shark is broken. I think it's called the Broadway play that I've been wanting to see for about three years. Uh, I cannot wait to see this play. So I'll tell you about that later. But anyway, I'm walking home and I'm legitimately fucking scared. And I hadn't really been scared like that up until that moment in my life, you know, you're, when you're a kid, you're scared. Yeah. You know, it's that thing scary or something, you know, but nothing like this. And I got home and my mom and uh, my dumb stepdad, Ron were there. And I was like, Oh, Hey. And they're like, Oh, how is the movie? Herbie love bug or whatever. Oh, it's funny. And they're like, Oh, cool. So, it's time to go to bed and I'm in my room and I cannot turn the light off. And I didn't turn that light off for a couple months. My mom kept coming and going, Hey, why is the light on? And I'd be like, Oh, uh, I must've fell asleep with it. You know, told John Lovitz, that's the ticket. Yeah. I must've fell asleep with it. <laughs> but man, it fucking rocked me. It rocked me uh, hard. And then I remember like two years, uh, maybe a year after that, I saw The Heretic. I didn't really understand it. My grandma, I talked to her into taking me, old grandma out there. And uh, I was visiting my grandma in Fresno. And she said, what movie do you want to see? I go, I want to see The Heretic. So I want to go back and watch The Heretic because I'm trying to figure out. It was so weird. It was like kind of science-y. You know, but uh, my point to all this is there I was last night performing for Linda Blair. And it's such a fucking crazy world sometimes that I think about like, wait a minute, this woman, it, it, you know, one of the greatest films ever. And here I am, which is the 50 year anniversary performing for her dog charity. Just unreal how life works. Now, I was looking over some um, stats on The Exorcist. Uh, of course, it was the what first uh, scary movie horror film that was uh, nominated for Academy Awards. Linda Blair nominated. Unbelievable. Tons of nominations. Won a couple, but won Best Picture for the Golden Globes. And... It, you know, made 193 million. Here's the funny thing. I didn't know, but when it first came out, the original release, it came out during Christmas. What the fuck? And you can go on YouTube and you can watch some outtakes. You can also watch the making of the exorcist. You can see how they did the bed spin, the floating, uh, the bed moving and, the and, uh, the split P and all of that. You can see all of that shit. It's fucking, it's crazy to watch this stuff. And you can also watch one of my favorites, the SNL spoof with Richard Pryor. And I think Lorraine Newman. And it is funny as fuck, man. SNL spoof in the exorcist, but you can watch these audiences seeing the exorcist and fucking screaming and running out scared from the movie. They said at the only test screening, which they, you know, they'll test a, a movie out on an audience. People fucking left. That's how scary this movie is, especially early 70s. You know, now Rosemary's Baby, I watched that uh, when I was young and it didn't really do much for me. Now I need to go back and rewatch Rosemary's Baby. But, um, you know, I wanted to get into some of my favorite scary movies. Number two is definitely The Omen for me. That's another Satan movie. It's funny to think about two Satan movies scare the shit out of me. And then later I'm into like, you know, devil music. You know, I'm a kid listening to devil music. Holy shit. Merciful fate. Iron made number of the beast. Devil shit, man. Shout at the devil. Motley Crue, shout at the devil. <laughs> the omen, though. Damien. Oh, my God. 
How evil was that fucker? Omen is a masterpiece also. So I was going through it. Let me get my list here. And, uh, you know, Chainsaw Massacre. Chainsaw Massacre to me is uh, scary as fuck. Because when you're growing up around the uh, serial killer era, and even right now, um, you know, there's fucking weirdos out there. I mean, weirdos. And uh, Chainsaw Massacre is so, at the time, remember, it was pitched as a true story, like some fucking crazy family in Texas. And that other one, the town that set the dread sundown. You know, fucking life is scary these days. It pretty, it's pretty scary. It's way scarier than The Exorcist. I'll take the fucking film any day. Okay, so Omen, number two for me. Scary shit. Uh, Hellraiser, when it came out, it was so scary and uh, state-of-the-art and new. Pinhead, all of that shit, the box. That was a that was a scary fucking movie. And like I said, Chainsaw Massacre, which later on, I think that Get Out was a well, well done. And a um it was a spin definitely on I think a flavor of uh Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I really feel Get Out has a a a, a hat tipped to the uh the great chainsaw massacre uh it's alive when it's alive came out holy shit did it get some fucking locker school locker talk you know everybody like, dude you see it's alive oh my god the milkman the milkman it's alive with the fucking baby with the claw Oh, it's gnarly. The lady's having the baby. It comes out. <laughs> it's alive. It's fucking great. Which, by the way, there's a new scary movie out right now, Night of the Hunted. Uh, my friends did. And it's on, um, shit, I think it is. It, I can't remember where you can stream it, but Google Night of the Hunted and uh, LA Times, top 10 scary film this year. Pretty cool. And my uh, buddy Jeremy Scipio is in it. I got him the audition, actually. And he was one of the rare people that thanked me, thanked me for uh, getting him the audition. <laughs> uh, Night of the Hunted, go check that out. Uh, Reanimator, people don't talk about that one a lot, but Reanimator was fucking, that shit was crazy, man. Reanimator, that at the time, you know, these movies were getting like they were up in the game as like technology and shit started uh, getting better on films. Of course, we got the classic Friday the 13th, the first one, Freddy Krueger, Nightmare on Elm Street, the first one, Halloween, the first one, all the first ones later. It's like, come on, man. You know, Halloween 39 directed by fucking white zombie Rob Zombie. But those, you know, the classic, they always had that classic scene, like the end where Jason's hand comes out. Holy shit, was that fucking scary. Everybody just screams. Which, by the way, I went to see the, uh, Nick Cave over the weekend downtown. You want to talk about fucking scary downtown L.A. right now? Oh, my God. Parked in this parking garage. I was legitimately wish wishing I had, like, fucking mace a gun or whatever man it's it smelled like hot urine and there was actual dead rats around <laughs> fucking nuts oh my god i went to go see nick cave i'm gonna get into that in a minute let me finish this movie thing here um let's see what else i mean you know jaws is scary it scared people never to swim in the ocean again to me, Jaws was really more about this fucking, it was the acting, man, that really won me on Jaws, just watching this fucking, these three guys deliver out on this boat, man. God damn. And that, that fucking shark, 
I still think the shark looks great. I think it looks fantastic. Anyway, okay, so those are my some of my favorites. Hellraiser, I said that one. It's Alive, Chainsaw, Exorcist, uh, The Omen, all of those great ones. Hats off to the, uh, the scary movies and happy Halloween, everybody out there. So like I said, I went to see uh, Nick Cave. I saw Nick Cave the first time. Let's see, what year was that? Let me look that up. Uh, 1994 on the Let Love In Tour, which is uh, oh, an absolute masterpiece of a record. I didn't really know who Nick Cave was growing up. Uh, I wasn't uh, hip to the birthday party. I found the birthday party backwards once I was in love with Nick Cave. Um, uh, Casey Chaos turned me on to Nick Cave early on when I met Casey. I was young, 1994 it came out. Went to uh, visit Casey. He's like, yeah, you heard the new Nick Cave? I was like, and Nick Cave? And I go, oh, yeah, Nick Cave? Oh, yeah, I fucking love him. Yeah, <laughs> fucking didn't know nothing about Nick Cave, you know? You don't want to not look cool. I hadn't heard of Nick Cave. He put it on. I heard let, uh, uh, Red Right Hand. Let me get this track list in. It's so fucking great. Uh, Do You Love Me? It opens the, opens the album. Immediately, I'm hooked on this guy's voice. Lover Man, Red Right Hand uh ain't gonna ain't gonna rain anymore this record was a game changer for me a game changer so i go see him at the in san francisco at that place fuck where joey diaz and i did a couple years ago i don't know a couple years ago like fucking five or something where the exploratorium is i don't know why i always fucking forget the name of the venue but I go see Nick Cave and I could not believe how incredible it was. There are performances in my life that have changed me so much. And I feel these artists are here on this earth to steer you into inspiration and let you know this is another level of shit and try to reach that level. You may never get there, but at least have a high watermark. And this is where it is, right here. Nick Cave, 1994. Uh, a Tom Waits on the Bone Machine Tour or Mule Variations. These are the ones that, look, I've seen tons of shows and they've been mind boggling. ACDC with Bon Scott, Iron Maiden on the Number of the Beast Tour. Uh, Queens of the Stone Age on the Rated R tour, uh, you know, uh, multiple shows throughout my life. Uh, Page Plant, 96, I believe. These ones where you're just going, yeah, yeah. But then there's these fucking shows that are as much about art as they are about music. Nick Cave, Tom Waits, uh, Tool. Karen Finley, not a musician, but a performance artist that completely just blew my fucking mind seeing Karen Finley do this performance art. Henry Rollins, spoken word. These are people that are another level to me of like, I said, like just, there's no fucks give. They're not looking, to, they don't care if they get famous. They're not trying to write hits. They're like, this is what I love. If you like it too, cool. If not, good day. Good day. Good day, sir. In the words of Gene Wilder on uh, Charlie and the Chaga Fay, I said, good day, sir. Anyway, great film, by the way. Chaga Factory. Fuck, they got a new one coming out? I don't know. I'm going to see it, yeah. But I don't know. I still need to see the new Scorsese and I need to see uh, Priscilla, the uh, Sofia Coppola film. I'll see those this week. Somehow I must get them in. Anyway, I go see Nick Cave. This is the second time I've seen him. Is it the second or third? 
I I think it's the second. And he's playing solo. No, no bad seeds. It's solo him on a piano. He's got Colin Greenwood on bass from Radiohead, which was a fucking surprise to me. I had second row seats. I signed up on the uh, pre-sale and I never, ever win. But one time I got front row for Black Crows on the uh, Three Snakes tour, Berkeley Community. And this time, second row, uh, just being a fucking uh, a civilian getting the getting the ticket master code and signing in and I got second row. I was literally two feet away from Nick Cave. And he came out and he starts, first of all, his fucking vibe is incredible. He's lost two sons. He's lost two sons, man. He's 66. He looks fucking amazing. More proof that if you do heroin for a long time and you don't overdose and die, it somehow embalms your body to where you just look fantastic for life and you live forever like William S. Burroughs or fucking Keith Richards, Nick Cave. Nick Cave, 66, comes out. He fucking makes me look like a grandpa. Just a fucking great, looks like a, like a Tom Ford suit on that's perfect, like some Gucci, Gucci fucking shoes, perfect black dyed hair, no lossage, just that same Nick Cave look he's had the entire time I've uh, known him. And his voice is flawless. His voice is flawless. I will tell you this. He didn't fucking play one song off... Uh, he didn't play one song off fucking Let Love In. And uh, I was a little, I was a little uh, disappointed. And I went back and I looked at a lot of set lists over the years. He doesn't seem to touch that record in, uh, much at all. If anybody knows why, let me know. I am not a Nick Cave, um, y- you know, I, am, I don't know everything about him. What I do know is I love him. I've seen him twice. I listen to all his records. Murder Ballads, fucking great. Henry's Dream, which he played. Papa won't leave you, Henry. Papa won't leave you, son. God, that song's so great. He killed it on the piano on that. What a tune that is. His voice is fucking it's it's so original and radical. And just to think about the birthday party, there's a documentary out, which I'm dying to see. I think it's out right now on the birthday party. But uh, I haven't seen it yet. Somebody tipped me off to it, and I've got to see it. So uh, he comes out. He's just fucking festive. And I guess he was living in L.A., uh, the last five or six years or something I read, which is amazing. I, I, I couldn't imagine just being down at like, uh, you know, blue bottle, getting a coffee and you look over and it's Nick Cave. <laughs> Nick Cave's a guy to me. Definitely doesn't go out during the day. He's got the old school goth vampire, pasty white and uh, just super skinny. No longer on dope, but still has that great heroin uh, addict, skinny body. That's the look. <laughs> I remember at one point I was getting so skinny. I was telling Burr, I go, man, my fucking head looks giant. Cause my buddy's like, Oh no, you can rock it, man. It's that rock and roll. Look that heroin body. <laughs> I was like, fuck. Anyway, Nick cave, man. If you can see him, I think there's a few more dates on this tour. I tell you what, do not fucking miss this. And I saw it at the Orpheum. Which is, uh, because last time he came, I believe he played the forum with the Bad Seeds, and I was on tour when it happened. And uh, if you can see him in a theater, there's no better way to see Nick Cave. Uh, The Orpheum is a masterpiece of a theater. Downtown LA has the Ace, the Orpheum. It has all these great theaters that are just fucking primo for concerts and comedy 
and they're just beautiful, ornate. They're clean. They've restored them all. This one had like a, they got like a full on kind of a bar area at this one with all cool photos up. They got fucking popcorn, You're eating popcorn, watching Nick Cave. Um, man, what a fucking theater. I, I'm still pretty fucking blown away by Nick Cave. And it, I still think about that time I saw him in 94. I just never, ever, ever forgot it. And he, there he is. Look at that, man. like 94. He's like, I think it's like 40 or something, you know? I don't know. But I was thinking about how young I was. And he was like, he's 66 now. This guy can just play for the rest of his life. He's got the ultimate following. He's playing quiet ballads. And there's no fucking fools yelling out. You know, just a great, great audience. Probably read. They probably read books. You know, it's a, it, it's just that there's this dream. Uh, uh, if whatever you're doing, comedy or music or uh, film, there's a dream. You want to curate this great crowd of people that are into stuff you're into. I feel like I have it a lot with with my Patreoners, which is great. When I talk to the people on the Patreon, when we do the live Zooms, I'm like, these people I'll fucking hang out with. And you want fucking shitloads of those people. You want a great audience that will take a ride with you if you decide to do something, uh, you know, outside the box. You want to do something different. They're like, I'm, I'm down. Uh, you know, maybe Kiss the Elder wasn't your favorite, but they tried something different. <laughs> which by the way, it's the anniversary. I think 45th anniversary of kiss meets the phantom that fucking movie game changer. When you're a kid watching kiss meets the phantom, there's your favorite band on TV on a Sunday night movie or maybe Friday night. I can't remember what night it was on, but fuck that's, that's one thing I always, uh, you know, there's a, uh, there's a Halloween uh, one or two Halloweens in my back pocket where I was definitely uh, Gene Simmons. I was never uh, Paul Stanley. I was never Peter Chris. I was never uh, Ace. I was always Gene. And it was just fucking horrible. That's that's why when I had Gene Simmons on the podcast, I was really asking him, like, how the fuck did you paint those? Each guy, you had to have four guys that could paint you know, could draw a straight line. I can't draw shit. I can sing and I can, I can, you know, kind of, kind of sing and kind of write songs and kind of write jokes and shit. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm fucking working my ass at it. But man, could I never fucking paint? You know, I can't paint Gene Simmons shit on me. I had friends that could, man. You just call them over, dude, paint it, paint it up. And they'd fucking do you up right. Oh, I remember one year I went as the Fonz. It just hit me. I went one year as the Fonz. I think maybe fifth or sixth grade. And my mom got that spray can uh, stuff to spray your hair black. It was like a spray can, temporary shit. And the next day it, it wouldn't come all the way out. So I had to go to school and I had gray hair. Full Benjamin Buttons, just sixth grade with full gray hair, just a gray. It, it took a few days to come out, but I went as the Fonz. Hey, oh my God. Halloween, good memories, man. Good memories of fucking, uh, you know, rock and roll. I want to give a shout out real quick. Uh, I want to. I want to mention this. I was in San Francisco a while ago and I didn't mention it. And I want to talk about it. Omega has a boutique in Union Square, Omega Watches. And, I, you know, you guys, I love watches. And it was a really rare, uh, rare to have this 
uh, uh, amazing treatment, go into a, a watch boutique and talk to the people that work in there and they love watches. That's rare these days, you know, because pretty much watch people are uh, kind of either just doing it as a job or they're jaded. But I wanted to give a shout out to the Omega Boutique in Union Square, San Francisco. Go in there, tell them I sent you. And I've just been obsessed with Omegas in the last five years. When I started, you know, my watch addiction, I, Omegas was not on my uh, radar. They were on my radar, but they weren't on my list, you know. And then Kevin Christie was way into Omega and a few other friends of mine, they're like, you, you got to have a Speedmaster in a collection. And, and now I truly believe that the Omega Speedmaster uh, is the greatest, just, you know, perfect all around watch. It's got the history of going to the moon. It's got the dope ass chronograph dial and it's never changed. It's like, you know, the movement's changed over the time. Just uh, it's kind of like the Porsche 911 to me of uh, watches. It's just got this fucking lineage and this amazing design. And uh, it was great to meet these people. And I, I've been meaning to give them a shout out. And I just, I just forget. And then it hit me. I was talking to a, uh, I was talking to one of the guys there and I just, I was like, God, these guys are cool. Anyway, shout out to them. Uh, also, uh, that's not a sponsor or anything. I was just letting you know that once in a while you go into a shop and you're like, fuck, these guys are cool. Speaking of cool yesterday, there's a store here in LA called Modernica and they sell mid-century furniture at the highest level, they make it downtown right in LA. And this guy, Jay owns it. I met him years ago. He's a mid-century house freak. And uh, he's a furniture uh, historian. You know, he knows everything about mid-century furniture. And he decided to start building stuff that was mid-century and handmade in LA that it was primo quality. I drove by the store for years on, uh, I think it's on Beverly. And I was, I was like, what is Modernica? And one day I went in there and I was like, fuck, this is amazing. This guy, I talked to him for hours. He might do the podcast, actually. Anyway, they had a parking lot sale yesterday. And you had to, you had to be there at like 8 a.m. So I got up at like 6 a.m. And I had no idea. But when I got there, it was actually a modernism uh, flea market. It was modernism week flea market. And uh, it was Modernica's factory, but all around it, they had other people set up booths and there was just all this mid-century furniture. And it was so fucking cool. Uh, a lot of it, like the backdrop uh, here on my podcast, just tons and tons of amazing shit. And it was a great day. Uh, just, just so cool to go to like a flea market that was all mid-century furniture, Gr all great shit too. There's, you know, it was, wow. It, it, it was wild to see, you know, I, I brought Gertie and it got a little warm, so I had to get out of there. And next time I go, I guess he does it twice a year. I'm gonna leave Gertie home so I can really fucking just tweak out in there, man, because it was amazing the amount of vendors that were in there and how much shit all these people had. And a lot of it was really clean. So uh, I recommend if you live in California and this happens again, go. It's 10 bucks to get in. And is you're going to see some of the most interesting people, just people walking around that are just full on. You got the time travelers, you know, the guys there that, Dress like it's 1950. <laughs> Welcome to 2023, my friend. You know, and they got their their woman always. I've never seen a rockabilly time traveler guy date somebody that's not rockabilly, or the vice versa. A, a rockabilly uh, woman date a, a civilian dude. Like you don't see like me 
and a rockabilly it just they date their own kind only <laughs> and i remember i used to go to people's houses that were way rockabilly and they just everything was like you know formica uh dining room table and the fucking weird wall clock and uh, all of that and i love mid-century but I don't need to live my life like, okay, I'm going to have a truck with no AC. I don't go cell phone. I go rotary dial. <laughs> so you're going to see some time travelers out there. You're going to see some, there's some cool people there, man. Really cool. It was a, it was a great vibe. I bought a, uh, I bought like a console, an Eames console that I've wanted for a long time, but they were way too much money. They're like fucking 1300 bucks for this fucking dumb little console, but they're selling them out there for three and 400 bucks. And uh, there was like four of them. And I picked one and this is the one that the cabinets worked good. Everything was clean on it. I was tweaking out on, and I was turning around to pay when I was turning around to pay some fucking dick comes up. He's trying to steal my cabinet door because they slide out and switch it with his Cause his is all scratched up. So I turn around, hey, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, you, uh, well, mine's kind of scratched. I don't give a fuck. This is mine. Well, mine's got, I didn't notice till I got to the car. This thing's flawed. And he'll get the fuck out of here. You, you don't just steal mine. I mean, I'm, I'm tipping my hat to fucking, you know, his quick, quick thinking of like, I'll just switch it with this one. I'll get the fuck out of here. But the way he was acting, like he was still looking at him both while I was saying, dude, get the fuck out of here. He's like, oh, okay, okay, relax. <laughs> you fucking asshole. I'm here. If you're going to pull a scam, don't do it while I'm here. <laughs> I want to give a shout out to a band, Pine Grove. Amazing band. There's a record called 1111. It came out a few years ago. I talked about it on my Patreon bonus episode a few uh, a few days ago. and. Uh, I I realize a lot of you aren't on Patreon. Join at patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey for tons of bonus episodes and live Zooms. But I wanted to give this band Pine Grove a shout out again. Um, also, real quick here, uh, before we get out of here, I want to say um, I've been back on a Lenny Kravitz kick. He's got a new single out. And uh, it's pretty fucking good. It's funky. And I'm looking forward to his new record. And and I want to give a, uh, a a huge shout out to Lenny Kravitz because he's been playing music since I was, I don't know, whenever uh, Let Love Rule, let Ro not to be confused with Let Love In, Let Love Rules came out. He was the opening band on the Tom Petty Into the Great Wide Open tour. And I was way into Let Love Rules. And uh, let me get this here. Hold on here. Lenny Kravitz. In, which, by the way, I saw a comedy store paid regular from the 80s, Stephen Kravitz, last night also. And um, it's good to see him still alive. He's out there slinging some comedy. He's had some health problems over the years, but... Uh, Steve Kravitz, when I first started comedy, he'd come over, hey, cool motorcycle, man. Anyway, Let Love Rule came out in 89, and I was in to Kravitz immediately. The amazing, amazing record, Freedom Train. I'm on the Freedom Train. Come on, dance on the Freedom Train. Mr. Cab Driver, masterpiece record right here. I build this garden for us, Fear. Uh, sitting on top of the world, unbelievable record, but nothing really prepared me for what he put out next, which was a game changer record for me called Mama Said in 1991. And it is an R&B rock and roll masterpiece. Fields of Joy, Always on the Run, Stand By My Woman, It Ain't Over Till It's Over. Uh, more than anything in this world, what goes around comes around, the difference is why. The difference is why stop dragging my heart. Uh, stop dragging around flowers for Zoe. Uh, this thing is in fields of joy. This record is a masterpiece. And uh, Lenny Kravitz has been in the biz most of his life, man. 
uh, from 89 to now, he's about to put out a new record. He's still got uh, Craig on guitar. Uh, my buddy on drums, fucking uh, 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 drawing huge blank right now. Huge blank. Hold on. Let me get this because I want to fucking. Uh, I'm on the freedom train. Come on, dance on the freedom train. Uh, Franklin Vanderbilt. I don't know fucking draw a blank like that. My brain's working. I've known Franklin for years. And then it just fucking will stall out. Follow Franklin Vanderbilt, by the way. He's one of the most positive, amazing people I know. He's just a fucking solid human. He let me stay at his apartment for a long time when I was getting my uh, getting my uh, teeth, you know, dug into the New York comedy scene. And he's a great fucking drummer. Great drummer. Oh, my God. I hope to have him at the Bon Scott Tribute. Anyway, Lenny Kravitz, I, uh, I uh, you know, uh, hats off to you, man. You've always fucking killed it. You're an amazing singer. You're an amazing songwriter. And you, um, like, I'm talking like Lenny listens to this. But you, you look fucking great. You live healthy. You got a fucking real estate portfolio that knocks me the fuck out. And um, I just dig what you do, man. Hopefully one day I'll be able to talk to you on the podcast. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Don't forget the tour dates are on dndelray.com. There is merch on there. Uh, leave a review and subscribe on iTunes for this podcast. Believe it or not, uh, a fucking review that takes one minute really helps. And thank you for everybody tuning in. I'm glad you dug that Kenny Wayne Shepherd episode. He was a, a great guy to have on. Got some uh, more guests coming up, more solo episodes and uh, more Patreon stuff. Hope to see you out at the show. Next stop, Madison Square Garden. It's going to be a fucking, uh, just a, a mind blower. Thank you, Bill Burr, for taking me for the ride. And I love all you guys. Have a safe Halloween. Candles are lit. Yes.